The Italian Radio Hour is sponsored by Istituto Mondo Italiano. Buonasera a tutti. Good evening and welcome to the Italian Radio Hour. Io sono Viviana and I would like to welcome back our regular listeners and also welcome to any new listeners and anyone listening online at khbradio.com. Also, be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook and also our YouTube channel not to miss any of the previous episodes. Benvenuti ai nostri ascoltatori da tutto il mondo. Grazie per essere con noi anche oggi mentre continuiamo il nostro viaggio per l'Italia e la cultura italiana. On uh, During last week's episode, we had two very interesting women, Nadia Fugazza, um, the author of the podcast Murder Italian Style, and Alessandra Rellini, a clinical psychologist during the day and the owner of a beautiful farm and agriturismo in Vermont. Two very interesting lives, uh, two very interesting stories. But before we get to our guest tonight, Let's find out the answer to last week's trivia question. What is the meaning of trovarsi con le spalle contro il muro? This expression was actually, I was listening to an interview of um, author and journalist Beppe Severnini as he was discussing one of his latest books. And he says that the Italians perform at their best when they find themselves, again, with the shoulders against the wall. So that's when their ingenuity, their way of improvising and improvising and finding solutions to a problem seem to occur. So trovarsi con le spalle contro il muro, again, to find yourself with no way out and your shoulders against the wall. So our first guest tonight is New York Times bestselling author, Russell Shorto, and uh, we will be talking about his latest book, Small Town, um, Small Time, a story of my family and the mob. Ma prima, pubblicità. Do you want to learn, improve or master your Italian? Istituto Mondo Italiano can help. Located in the heart of Regent Square, Mondo Italiano offers small group classes and one-on-one private tutoring to help you learn Italian in no time. Visit us online at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org. And with no hesitations, I would like to bring on uh, Russell Shorto. Russell, Russell, are you with us tonight? I'm with you. Um, <laughs> something just happened, and I can hardly hear you now. I don't know. There was a, there was a strange noise. Can oh, you hear me? Yes, absolutely fine. Yes, so we don't have any problems okay, on our... It sounds like you're way on the other side of the room. <laughs> Um, so, Russell, um, your your publications, your books uh, precede, obviously, um, the uh, your six earlier books, including Amsterdam, A History of the World's Most Liberal City, a national bestseller, The Island at the Center of the World. Um, you, um, the work that you, the, the Scarlet's Bones, the work that you have done uh, exploring the uh, Dutch uh, contribution in the United States and in, in New York, actually, um, earn you the knighthood from the Dutch government. Is that correct? Okay, let's see. Let's see what's going on here. Um, let's see if we can get uh, Russell back on the line. This is the beauty of live radio. And uh, it looks like... Yeah. He, uh, can you yes, hear me now? Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Yes, I um, uh, I spent, uh, for much of my career, it's been focused on uh, writing narrative history, that is, storytelling about the past, about uh, New York. And since New York's origins are Dutch, New York was once New Amsterdam, uh, I've uh, got this um, real Dutch focus. And that was something I spent most of my career on until um, until the last book. Uh, yes, and uh, you also uh, lived in the. Uh, you also lived over there. You you speak Dutch fluently, uh, correct? I lived in Amsterdam for seven years. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, so um, 
Yes, now everyone is, you know, it's everyone is talking about your uh, latest book, a small, a small time, um, a story of my family and the mob. So uh, take us to Johnstown. What maybe Johnstown um, looks like now? Uh, what it looked like when um, the um, your family uh, was was living there? So let's start from the um, because this is going to be. Specifically sure. Uh, Johnstown is um, about an hour and a half to two hours from Pittsburgh, uh, depending on how fast you drive. For me, it's two hours. For my brother, it's an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, historically a steel town. Um, and that means that in the early and mid 20th century, it was really booming. The population was about 70,000 people. And uh, they called it Little Chicago at one point. And it, it uh, went through the whole Rust Belt decline that so many places did. Um, and now the population is right around 20,000. So it's really just a, a shadow of what it once was. It's still, uh, I say all the time, it's a great place to be from. Uh, the people are wonderful. Um, and it's uh, like so many places, tr- struggling to, to, to reinvent itself. Mm-hmm. So you would say it's a great place to be from. So on which occasion, uh, if you can share with our listeners, uh, did you go back home? That became a little bit the triggering uh, point of um, the request of about writing about this story. It was um, uh, at Christmas yeah, time, I believe. Uh, I, you know, again, it's very hard for me to hear what you're saying, but I think you're asking uh, about when I went back home and uh, uh, and visited at Christmas several years that, ago that and is, began that is to correct. kind of unpack mm-hmm. the story of my grandfather. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, I was um, home, uh, I was living in Amsterdam at the time, actually, and went home uh, to visit over Christmas and a day or two after Christmas, uh, we're sitting, a group of relatives sitting in my parents' living room. And being this Italian family, everyone's always packed in and there's food going around. And, uh, and um, uh, someone mentioned that my mother's cousin, Frank Filia, was in town. And uh, he, Frank had, I, had ba- I barely knew him, but he uh, had uh, moved decades earlier. He was a jazz musician and he had moved to Las Vegas and had a whole career there. And he had recently retired and moved back to town. And they said that in this gathering, somebody mentioned that Frank was playing in a little jazz combo at a local club and we should all go see him. So we all got in our cars and went down to see Frank. And uh, he plays stand-up bass and he sings, you know, kind of Frank Sinatra-style songs, Fly Me to the Moon and things like that. And there's a break in the set and we're all standing around talking, and he looked across at me, and he pointed his finger at me and said, Russell, you're the writer in the family. What are you going to do about the story? And I said, what story? And he said, what story? Your grandfather, the mob. And I could feel everyone else kind of freeze up because we all knew the story. We all knew that my grandfather and his brother-in-law ran the mafia in town uh, back in the day. But we also knew that you don't talk about it openly. And here was Frank just talking very openly about it. And it turned out that he, um, before he moved to Las Vegas, when he was still kind of a kid, he uh, worked for him. He ran numbers and he worked in the pool hall for him. So to him, to Frank, these were just great stories about his his youth and the town when it was full of life. Um, So he kind of pop the bubble. You know, I had created this little wall myself in my mind that you don't think about that. But he made me realize that this is history. I mean, he actually said to me, you write history. This is history. And he was right. This is American history. It's Italian American history. And that's what I do. And so slowly, he convinced me to to explore it. 
And that's what I started to do over the next few years. So um, obviously, um, that was probably not the, you know, it might have triggered some curiosity, but not obviously the easiest choice to um, bring this story up. I mean, it did have historical value, but there were, I'm sure, some other relatives or other individuals that really didn't want to uh, be involved in this, uh, telling the story. How did you resolve that conflict? I'm sure someone pushed back. On the idea. Yeah, there were some um, relatives. I mean, actually, what really surprised me was how many were interested in participating. And it turned out that, you know, everybody, I think because everyone kind of didn't want to talk very much about it, people only knew one little piece of it that they had experienced. Uh, and they were kind of curious about, about, you know, what I would find out, what the, whole, what the larger story was. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, and, and, and it was also true that uh, people began, as I talked to them, I think they realized that, I mean, my grandfather and his generation, they're long dead. And this, it's going to go away. You know, it, it's going to fade and no one will remember it. So people opened up more and more. And I would get groups of two and three and four people together and they would start sharing, comparing notes and swapping stories. And um, and it was really a wonderful experience overall. But yes, some family members didn't want to go there. They felt that this is uh, shameful, maybe, uh, uh, or maybe it was very painful memories for them. And they do, didn't want to go there. And I talked with them about it, and I explained what I was going to do. And I said, I understand you're, you have a right to feel that way, but I ha- it's my story, too, and I have mm-hmm. a right to explore it. And I've, I've talked with other people who've written memoirs or family stories uh, who've had similar experience with certain family members who just didn't want to go there. Maybe they felt resentful of the whole project, but uh, they kind of said the same thing, too. You know, it's, uh, I have a right to tell, to investigate my own family story. Indeed. So uh, we will talk about probably the hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, Panera conversations and recording uh, in the oral history. But obviously, because of also the nature of the uh, the work that you have done before, uh, all your investigation was taken to utmost seriousness as far as checking records. And I believe also a trip to Italy. So can you tell us a little bit about the actual investigation to um, get more information or to double check your facts and also your trip to Italy. Yeah. Um, well, uh, this was a different venture for me because I was writing um, within living memory. Most of the other books that I've done have been written, they're, they're events from hundreds of years ago, so there's nobody I can interview. Uh, so I had the enormous advantage, and it was really exciting to be able to, as you say, uh, compile hundreds of hours of interview material with people and then compare and contrast what they were saying. So that's one way to kind of check, uh, check accuracy. But that I wasn't content with that because, I mean, as great as the stories are, we all know what that's like. I mean, people's memory over time fades or, or becomes kind of softer. Or they romanticize the a little a bit, way. maybe. Uh, so I... Um, also did the kind of research I would do on other books. Um, I went to the police uh, in in Johnstown, and they gave me access to their records office, and I was able to corroborate that, yes, this this person was arrested at, <laughs> on this date or whatever. Uh, of course, looking at the um, the Johnstown Tribune Democrat, <laughs> the local newspaper, their, their archives, um, the local library. Um, so I would, um, and, and I did a Freedom of Information Act request with the FBI and got files of information. It took several years, so if you're going to do that, mm-hmm. be warned. Um, but, uh, you know, by then putting those things together, you know, you have the documentary record, and then I've got the stories, the living, breathing stories that people are telling me. And slowly I'm able to put those things together and compile what I feel like is a pretty solid version of what happened. So that was that was basically how I how I wrote the book. And you also asked about my trip to Italy. I um, took my family. We went to Sicily, 
my um, uh, we're talking about my father's father, and his family came from San Pier Niceto, which is a little village in the hills above uh, above Messina in in Sicily. And uh, we went there, and we went to the town, and I had connected on the internet. I'd found a man named uh, Mario Italiano, who's the um, uh, kind of uh, village historian who worked in the uh, town hall, and he did a lot of research for me, looking up uh, people's uh, birth certificates and so on. And he and his wife and his family took us on a tour, this wonderful tour of the whole town, and um, we just we walked into his uh, mother's house, and she had uh, dinner, dinner for us. And um, he showed me that he had actually found the house. Hmm where my great-grandfather was born, and it's a house that dates from about 1500. It was all in ruins, but he actually found the house. So it was wonderful for me to get that kind of depth of, of experience, to really feel like you're really grounding the story. Um, and uh, this is actually, you know, where... I think a lot of value uh, resides in your book is because of the analysis that you have done that I would like you to walk us through about what was it like to, when people came here, kind of believed in certain opportunities. And again, this is not to justify, but to have an understanding of what it looked like for immigrants, and whether it was Southern Italians or also from other regions when they came here. I, th- I'm, so I think you're asking me about the, the immigrant experience and what uh, it uh, felt like um, to be yes. immigrants at that time. Yes, exactly, because you, yeah. you, you give sorry. it a Again, social, con- a cultural context. Um, uh, that was something that, you know, again, I could get one level of it from interviews with people. Um, but uh, not many of the people who I was interviewing were themselves immigrants. Those people were gone. This was my great-grandfather and great-grandmother emigrated to America around 1900. And um, they experienced uh, enormous prejudice. And I think this is where, really, the, the, the mob comes out of. You have two things. You have American immigration— these waves of, immigra- of immigrants, millions of people came from southern Italy to the, to the U.S. Uh, within about a 30-year period. And then you have this incredible outpouring of prejudice and discrimination by Americans, part, some of whom feel that they're taking jobs from them, but mostly it was a uh, fear of uh, the Catholic Church. You know, there, it was against Italians, but also against Irish and other immigrants. Uh, and America was a very Protestant nation, and they felt that they were being essentially invaded by the Pope. And um, so there was this just tremendous uh, uh, prejudice, and that extended to not being able to get jobs uh, except for the very lowest, uh, lowest paying jobs. Even in Johnstown, the steel mills were the main employers. They, didn't, they wouldn't employ Italians except in extreme cases, like if there was a strike. So that's how uh, harsh that yeah. was at that time. And um, so you couple that with, at this, uh, in this period when my grandfather was born, he was born in 1914, 1920, prohibition, prohibition comes into effect. So suddenly it's illegal to manufacture and sell alcohol. People like my great grandmother knew how to manufacture <laughs> alcohol. So all over the country, you have these people um, taking up this. You know, everybody still wanted to drink. Uh, they all then start to supply it, and that's where kind of the precursor to the uh, mafia comes into being by providing this public service. Uh, and then by the course, and it developed really, I think, into into an industry almost into a. A, a very um, sophisticated network over the course of the 20s, so that by the time Prohibition ended, they had already decided what their next revenue stream was going to be, and that would be gambling. And that's really what my grandfather, um, uh, he came of age really at the, at, the, at the height of the mafia in America. And, and we're, of course, I'm talking about a small town, and so we're really talking about the small town mafia, which is 
rather a different thing than what most people think of when they think of the mob in Chicago or New York, for example. Um, so I'm sure everyone's curiosity um, is to find out what were the uh, what was the operations like, uh, what were some of the activities. Um, I remember the tip seals, number games, and yeah. who was attending because they were kind of out in the open. Uh, it was kind yeah. of uh, even the mayors or even the the raids were kind of organized in a way that they would get a tip and someone maybe was going to get the blame for it. And so tell us a little bit, what were some of the popular activities um, in the... Yeah, it, it was really a, you, as you say, it was out in the open. It was, uh, they, they made regular payoffs to the mayor and to the police. And in fact, their, their center of their operation was called City Cigar. It was a cigar shop in the front and a pool hall in back and upstairs were the offices. And it was called City Cigar because it was, next to the city hall and the mayor would come over regularly and have uh, a chat have a chat with them and he would leave with an envelope in his pocket and um in exchange for that they had this operation which was providing gambling services and another thing that i think is important to note there is that the, the mob has its heyday in america before television hit uh, in 1950, five percent of American households had a TV. By 1960, 90 percent did. And what that meant before TV became such a regular force, it meant that people had all this spare time and they had some money and they wanted to, you know, to amuse themselves. So you went out, you went to the local tavern or hotel lobbies or uh, diners or wherever, and you played the numbers and there were uh, people who would um, sell you numbers and you would uh, scratch and uh, scratch your number and uh, or your tip seal and see if you won. And maybe you won a dollar, maybe you won a quarter. And this was just such a, I mean, everybody I talked to in town over a certain age said that this was just a fact of life. Everybody played the numbers. Everybody had their regular bookie. And they also played these the, something called tip seals, which was kind of like a scratch-off lottery. Um, and uh, they had uh, card games and uh, dice games all over town. They had There were card games where all the big shots in town played for pots of thousands of dollars. So they organized all these different kinds of activities um, and they and they had um, uh, uh, pinball machines. You could, in those days you could gamble on pinball. Um, it was illegal, but you know you could do it. That's where they would make the payoff. So it was really woven into the fabric of life to the extent that they uh, ran their candidate for district attorney, um, and everybody knew. You know, it was quite, it was quite in the open. And uh, so you, you mentioned the pinball. It just kind of uh, um, led me to another thought. They had also their hands in legal businesses because I would imagine that sometimes maybe they would put these machines and the owners of the establishment or maybe they needed a loan and if they couldn't pay off, maybe part of the business went to um, the um, uh, to the establishment, so to speak. Is that correct? Yeah, they um, they would uh, put the machines like pinball machines were very popular, and they would put them in um, in bars and cafes and restaurants and hotels. And um, the way it worked that you gambled on it was uh, you would you know if you're playing well, then you win free games. And once you had won a certain number of free games, you could go up to the bartender or to the counter and show them how many free games you won, and they would give you a payout. They would pay you that much in cash. You know, maybe for five free games, you won a dollar or something. Uh, so they would pay off, and the, the, so you were gambling, you were winning, or you, mostly you were losing, because that's how gambling works. And um, then that, the, the money that is taken in by the house gets split between the bar or the cafe and the mob that's bringing in the, the machine. So that's how they got their foothold into businesses all over the city. And then what would happen next is if 
uh, they would develop relationships with all those business owners. And if somebody was having a hard time, say, making rent, they would put up his rent. And over time, they might just buy him out. So they owned a number of legitimate businesses as well. Um, so despite the fact that, so to speak, everything was in the open because people were familiar with it. And I believe also in the cover of your book, you can probably see under the S, the um, the, 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 the uh, city cigar um, name. But, you know, we're trying to envision and picture what your grandfather looked like. And then you open the book and you see a, pic- a picture of him and it looks like it could be anyone's um you know, relative, so to speak. Um, so even though the business was out in the open, they didn't do fleshy things, right? Uh, do I believe that there was a no Cadillac rule? Um, I, I was, it was particularly hard for me to hear that question. You're asking about my grand my grandparents and their how they seemed like normal Americans? And the fact that, uh, you know, even though the business was out in the open, they didn't, um, uh, they had kind of the non Cadillac rule, like they were not showing sure off. Um, oh, you know, because oh, yeah, it was yeah. a pretty sizable yeah, operation. Would. So um, they kind of. Yeah, they you know, had a, um, a rule that they would not um, uh, show off. You know, you, you had, a, like my grandfather and his partner, his brother in law, um, they each lived, they didn't live in the, the nicest part of town. They lived in very middle-class neighborhoods. They had nice houses, but nothing, nothing special. They, um, they, they had a kind of no Cadillacs rule. You, know, you weren't allowed to drive a fancy car. Um, they all wore suits and ties, of course, but not, uh, not, uh, not uh, tailor-made suits. And, um, but when they went out, like the picture of my grandparents in the book, is them at Club Harlem in Atlantic City, which was a very um, uh, uh, a famous nightclub of the time. Uh, so when they went out, when they went to Atlantic City or they went to Florida, then you could show off. And the stories my relatives told was of them, you know, throwing, you know, hundreds of dollars around on, on gambling on horses or, you know, big meals for the whole family. They would go, they would rent a whole suite in the hotel. And so then they could... Uh, sort of uh, show off their wealth. Um, we talked about your grandfather. We talked about you writing the story. But obviously, there is a generation between your father. Um, how did he embrace this project? And how did that affect positively or uh, your uh, relationship? Because I purposely skipped um, talking about your father, kind of leave it for last, because I think that's another important factor of this uh, of this book there are so many different things that this book uh, creates value for and yeah. so this is an analysis of three four generations of males um in addition to everyone else in 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 the book can you can you tell us a little more about that yeah i'm glad you asked me about that um because really this for me you know, writing this family history, I mean, it was fascinating for me to connect in a deeper way with my Italian roots, with my Sicilian roots, uh, with my grandfather, who I knew very, very uh, little. Um, but really, uh, to me, for me personally, the book is really about m- my father and my relationship with him. And, and it is, as you say, this story of... Uh, succeeding uh, Italian-American male, uh, my great-grandfather, who was the immigrant, uh, who had a very hard time, then my grandfather, who took the prejudice and did something with it. He became part of this uh, operation of the mob. Um, then my, gra- my father comes along, who was his oldest son, and my father idolized him and idolized this operation, and he wanted to be part of that. And my grandfather actively and at times violently pushed him away. And this was a dynamic that I affected my father's whole life. And, this is, and he grew up and, and had his whole career in the same town. And it was so pronounced, this, uh, the difficulty between them, that even though they lived in the same town their whole lives, 
there was a long period of time when they basically didn't speak to one another. <laughs> and, and it was over this. And I only uncovered this in working on the book, this fact that, that uh, in fact, what was at the bottom of it was my father wanting to be in the mob and his father pushing him away from it. And, you know, my grandfather, my, in my family, he's not a very, he's not thought of as a very kind figure. But the big revelation for me was that in doing that, in pushing his son away, what he was doing was in effect saying, you don't need this anymore. You know, when he was, when my grandfather was coming up, he had no choice, really. I mean, there were so few opportunities for a smart, ambitious guy. But by the time my, my father was on the scene and coming up in the 1950s, he didn't need that. He could go to school. He could work. He could become a lawyer. He could do whatever. I mean, Italians weren't treated in the same way. So that was really a remarkable thing. And I would just end by saying that, you know, anybody who's interested in doing family history and exploring your family history, and interviewing relatives and all that is such a worthwhile uh, endeavor. And I actually did a, um, if you care to look at it, I created a course, mm -hmm. an online course you take yourself through called tellyourfamilystory.com, uh, which, in which you can just you know, gives you the steps of how I did it, because I think it's such a meaningful thing for anybody, Italian or otherwise. Indeed, because I think you come out with a stronger sense of who you are, um, because you find out maybe pieces that for you, maybe they were not, as, you know, uh, you couldn't explain before what certain dynamics, family dynamics of behavior until you really dug out and find out the whys. There are going to be tons of questions that I would have loved to ask you, but we're going to have the pleasure to have you in Pittsburgh at the Heinz History Center on Thursday, June the 9th with my friend Melissa Marinara and Sarah Green. And uh, this is going to be a program, I believe it's a hybrid, so people can come and meet you and, uh, and then also follow the wonderful conversation. So in the meanwhile, anyone listening, please get a copy of this small time story of my family and the mob so that you can have all those questions ready for Russell when he comes and visit us in Pittsburgh. Russell, this has been, you know, we just touched the tip of the iceberg, and uh, but it was a very nice and uh, insightful conversation, and I thank you very much for your time. Viviana, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, so now before we move to our second segment, just a little bit of publicita. Applying for dual citizenship, need documents translated, Istituto Mondo Italiano provides certified translation and interpretation services in 20 different languages. Be sure to visit us at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org. Okay, so we are ready for our second guest, Samuele Bozzolla. Samuele, Hello? buonasera. Welcome, welcome. Hi. Hi, uh, we can hear nice and clear. So oh, the, yeah. the name Samuele Bozzola might not ring a bell for some people, but for me, it does. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we go back how many years, Samuele? Uh, 20 at years? 15, yeah, at least 15, 20 years, exactly. Okay. Yeah, a long time. Yes, so Samuele didn't want to have any fancy introductions. So um, I'm going to say that he is a son of uh, un figlio d'arte, un nipote d'arte. So um, I would like to spend a few minutes, obviously, honoring and talking about uh, your family. So um, can you tell us who your mother uh, was? My mother, well, my mother who passed away in 2017 was Claudia Pinza. She was a voice uh, teacher and a former opera singer. She taught at Duquesne, at the University of Pittsburgh. She had a school in Italy that she brought young American artists to Italy for 32 years. And a lot of the uh, singers that went there had careers in opera and sang all over the world, uh, including people from Pittsburgh like Kevin Glavin, Mariana Cornetti, and, and others. And, of course, she got her talents and her... Um, daughter of the art that she was from my grandfather who was Ezio Pinza 
and who sang at the Met. But in this country, I think he's best known for being the original Emile de Beck in South Pacific in 1947. So, um, and uh, your mom, uh, she was born mm-hmm. in uh, uh, Buenos Aires, right? Uh, yes, and that because- is not a coincidence. What was happening? Uh, but it, the, the uh, Metropolitan Opera in the 20s used to do a summer tour in uh, South America. So they would leave from New York on a boat and they would do all the way around and they would rehearse on the boat. They would take the time that they had on the boat to rehearse. And then they would get to uh, Buenos Aires in this case and they would perform several operas and stay there well, six, seven weeks. And it just happened that my mother wasn't supposed to be born when she was, but she was and back in the 1920s, 25, when she was born. I guess things were not as easily, uh, you know, they, they, the doctors might have missed a couple of week, uh, weeks, a month or whatever. So she was born there and then she stayed there for oh, about a month and then they came back to New York and she really spent uh, her youth uh, in New York City with her father. Uh, we're going to really fast forward, um, but I mm-hmm. believe that uh, uh, your grandfather and your mom were separated during the war, so he was not aware that your mom, Claudia, had become such a famous uh, singer uh, on her own, um, in her own right. Is that correct? Mm, uh, no, because she actually debuted here in the United States. Okay. Which, uh, yeah, she debuted in, Fel- in, uh, in Faust at the Met, and then she sang pretty much all over the country in Philadelphia and San Francisco. As a matter of fact, the story that my mom tells is that she, her, her father said, I'd like to hear you sing. And she said, okay. So she started singing an aria from La Boheme. And my grandfather, I think, was worried that she was not good. So he put a, he held up the newspaper while she was singing. And when she was done singing, he took the newspaper away and he's, he was crying that to, you know, because he was so happy that she was as good as she was. Wow. So. I just get, mm-hmm. I'm just getting the chills hearing it. Uh, yeah. 1954, uh, Claudia is in Italy and she mm-hmm. meets a very special person, your father. Yes, exactly. Rolando. Yeah, that's an interesting story. My, my father at the time was young. I guess he was born in 32, and he was uh, with uh, my uh, his mother, and his mother said, listen, there's a mm-hmm. friend of ours that's coming in mm-hmm. to uh, from Italy, from the uh, United States, he's an opera singer, and then we have to entertain her, and my mm-hmm. father said, ah, I really don't feel like doing that, I'm, uh, okay. finally, he can, she convinced my father to go, he met her, they went out on this, at this party, and uh, after that, it was history. They, they never separated. So. Wonderful, wonderful. It was uh, 63 years of um, pure, um, yes, pure love. Yes, 63 years, exactly. Yes, 63 years, exactly, yes. And we are fast forwarding again to some of your mom's accomplishments. She had also one of the, um, I think, one of the longest uh, running uh, radio programs, uh, the yeah. uh, uh, Opera with Claudia, where she... Yes, exactly. exactly. Yes, she yeah. did that for 25 years, I believe. She did it on uh, WDQ, the former Duquesne University station. And it would be every day, every, I'm sorry, every Sunday from 2 to 5, live and she just uh, played uh, each week she decided uh, on a specific opera and then she then told you know her memories of that certain opera or other anecdotes of the um, you know the opera world uh, when she when she sang it or when she was with her father all those years and uh, uh, it, mm-hmm. And yeah, also intermittent very... uh, with also some, um, I heard that um, she would uh, divulge sometimes some of her favorite recipes or oh, yes, feedback yes, on yes, upcoming, yes, yes. upcoming yes. young singers and their personalities. Yes. <laughs> exactly, yes. And she also interviewed many, many singers that were famous at the time, like Placido Domingo. Uh, Jose Carreras, Mirella Freini, and so forth and so on. She would go mainly to New York to interview them, uh, and then she would record it, and then on that Sunday she would play back the interview. You know. Okay, so in the uh, description that we would have you, we said we'll have someone 
uh, that has had probably uh, more dinners with pa- Pavarotti than what he can recall. So, 1973, New York. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, my, uh, my father actually knew uh, uh, Il Maestro uh, because they, my father grew up in Bologna and, 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 his, and Maestro Pavarotti grew up in Modena. <coughs> So they kind of met on the playing field playing soccer. Any uh, any good <laughs> playing soccer? <laughs> uh, he wasn't bad. No, uh, you know the master wasn't too bad. So they kind of knew each other not really well. But then in '73 they re-met in New York and with my mother. And as soon as he found out who my mother was, he was ecstatic, and and that kind of started their relationship that really ended uh, in, in, when when he passed in 2007. So, and, <clears throat> my my parents brought him to Pittsburgh three separate times for yes. three concerts in '76, '78, and then in '81 they actually brought him with Dane Jones Sutherland at, and the Pittsburgh Symphony at Heinz Hall for a a, a mega concert. Uh, but then in '76 and '78 he came and sang at, at the Carnegie Music Hall in Oakland, just with piano. Those two concerts. And then the so. relationship with uh, Maestro Pavarotti was really so personal that I mean you have also another uh, brother Simone, so he mm-hmm. would call up to check how um, the two uh, were uh, doing, yes. and uh, so really like uh, having almost uh, an uncle, right? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, he was. He was very, very nice with with Simone, who's, who has cerebral palsy in the wheelchair, and uh, he was always because he had himself. He had a uh, a cousin who had the same inf- uh, uh, you know, disability, so he knew what it was like, and so he was very, very close to, to Simone all the time, and uh, it, it was just a, a you know a, a, an amazing relationship the two of them had, and also with my parents and and with you know and and myself how many times I I spent with him doing you know at concerts and and I got a, I, you know I got to know him outside of the stage and and but I have to say that the one thing that struck me and I've been in, you know in the world of arts for many many years the one thing that struck me is how professional he was whether I heard him singing one time in Erie in front of 200 people where he sang 110% just like he sang if he would sing at the Hollywood Bowl in LA in front of, you know, 15, 20,000 or if he sang at the stadium with the three tenors. Uh, he, he was just, it was unbelievable how professional. He gave his 110% no matter where he was and no matter who he was singing for. I mean, it was just unbelievable. That, that's the one thing I'll always remember about him. Pavarotti, the man, the, you know, the, the artist of anything else. He was really a professional uh, in every sense of the word. So um, so you talked about a maestro like the man. Uh, can you share some anecdotes or some stories that our sure. listeners might so, enjoy? Yeah, I'll tell you a few. Uh, in 2000, <laughs> he called me. In the, it was in May. He said, oh, we said, we're going to be in uh, Cleveland doing the three tenors. He said, why don't you drive up? You're in Pittsburgh and, you know, we'll, we'll spend a little time together and then we'll hear the concert. And I said, great. So he said, when you get to Cleveland, we're at the, um, we're staying, I think it was the Ritz Carlton. He says, go to the lobby and ask for me. And, and, and I, I, you know, they'll send you up and you'll, I'll give you the ticket and things. I said, great. So I went and, you know, I got there, I parked. Uh, I went to the, looked into the, the lobby and I went to the, um, hotel uh, concierge and I said hi I'm here to see uh, Luciano Pavarotti and he looked at me and says hold on so he went on the register and looked and he says who I said Luciano Pavarotti and he says mm. so I said well maybe I'm pronouncing it too many times so I said Luc-, you know, I said Mr. Pavarotti <laughs> And he said, no, he says, we don't have anybody by that name. And I said, well, it's strange. I just talked to him yesterday. He said, no. So I said, okay, hold on. So I went off out of the lobby and I called him uh, because I have, you know, on his on his personal phone. And he answered. And he said to me, he says, where are you? He says, you're late. He says, I got to get on the stage. I I have your ticket here. See, you're always late, he says to me. And I said, (laughs) I said, Maestro, I said. You don't exist in this hotel. He says, what do you mean? He says, you don't exist. He said, hold on. And he comes back two minutes later. He says, oh, he says, I'm sorry. Ask for Fred Flintstone. <laughs> so he had a great sense of humor as well. <laughs> yeah, so they gave him that name so that people wouldn't bother him. 
Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And uh, uh, what else? I'm sure you have plenty uh, of, so oh, go oh, ahead well. and you're on the roll, Samuel. Uh, <laughs> Please well, share everything you know, with us. One, one thing, I don't know if it's an angle or not, but mo- a lot of people, you know, especially, you know, he was very, very uh, heavy and, you know, he was over 300 pounds. But he was an excellent, excellent doubles tennis player. I played with him numerous times. He was an excellent player, especially at the net. Very fast, very agile. Uh, so that, that's 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 actually surprised me because he's as big of a of a man that he was. Uh, so so that that was interesting. Uh, another story. He was here uh, doing a concert. I think the second concert was seventy eight, and there was a rehearsal on Friday. So after the rehearsal, comes off the stage, goes up to my father, says, "Rondo," he says, "I have a request." And my father says, "Yes, Luciano, <laughs> I want to go ride horses." He looked at him and said, he said, look, he said, five o'clock in the evening, where am I going to find a horse for you to ride at this time of night? Friday. And, you know, the master said, looked at my father and said, if you don't find me a horse tomorrow, I'm not saying it. Oh, <laughs> I gave him an ultimatum. <laughs> so, so my father had formed a committee to, you know, to sell tickets and everything. So he called somebody on the committee and the gentleman said, yeah, let me see what I can do for you. Because he was an influential person. And, uh, a half hour later, he called back and he says, I have a horse in Swickley. Go head out. So we went all the way out to Swickley from Oakland. He gets there, gets on the horse. It had to be an extra size horse, of course. Gets on the horse, goes around the stable, looks at my father, says, OK, let's go and eat. <laughs> <laughs> did he have and, anything that uh, was he also a good cook or did he? Oh, yes, yes. He, he, he was a very good cook, an excellent cook and, of course, an excellent eater. After most operas, he would go home at 11, 11.30 at night, to midnight. He was such a, he was still on the high from singing that one of the things he loved to do is take a panettone, cut it in half, put whipped cream in the middle, and eat the whole thing. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar with a panettone, it's this Christmas cake is gigantic. So, mm-hmm. um, well, I'll give you one more. I'll give you one more. Uh, we were, my mother and I were in New York City for my mother had some auditions for a, a week. So, and he was there singing Tosca. And he called my mother and said, oh, you're here. And my mother said, yeah. He says, yeah, I'm singing Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday matinee. He says, I'm going to get your tickets for each one of these performances. So my mother said, oh, okay. So we went to the Tuesday night. We went to the Thursday night. And there was a Saturday two o'clock matinee. So we get there, we go, and you know, after at the after the first act is over, my mother looks at me and says, "I can't take this anymore." <laughs> he said, "If I see another Tosca, and you know, I, I, so he says we're going." He says, "I need to go shop because my mother was an avid shopper." So we left. Well, about seven thirty at night, we're in the hotel. Phone rings, and it's. No, I support up. He says to my mother, why did you leave? <laughs> oh, so he was keeping an eye on her. <laughs> oh, yeah, because we were like in the third row. And he oh. was rather upset. And my mother was like, well, Luciano, you know, we, we, I needed to do a few things, you know. So he says, uh-huh, see, si, see, si, but he called, he, called my, he called my mother Bambina. Bambina, lovely, Bambina. lovely, yeah, lovely. Yeah, yeah, so... So yeah, but uh, it was it was you know thoroughly enjoyable. I saw him as I said. Uh, the first time I saw him was in Philadelphia uh, when he sang La Bohème, which was one of his favorite roles to sing. And of course, you know when when he did recitals, his big big song at the end was uh, Puccini's Turandot Nessun Dorma. That's always he, he he ended that. And I saw him in San Francisco doing that at a recital and when that when that was over they gave him a 10 minute standing ovation that's a long time to give somebody a 10 minute standing ovation yeah Yeah. so he was just he was just a special person and I, i think that what i would like to maybe portray most of all to people is that he was an opera singer he was not a rock star he was not a movie star he was an opera singer an opera is known but it's not as known as you know when you go to a rock concert or to to see a movie or to see a movie star but he is the only one that i've ever met and i don't think there'll ever be another person like that that was like a rock star people just it it was unbelievable The, the the people they were just crazy for him just like if you would go see you know a concert by uh, you know the rolling stones or the beatles it, it was just unbelievable it was truly unbelievable to see 
the reaction of the people for a person who sang opera and who sang in recitals and things like it, it was unbelievable. It was. And I don't think the opera world will ever have somebody like that ever again. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think I'll ever be a person that was like such a magnet to people, just like a rock star would have been. I mean, he would, and, and you know, after the operas were done, he would sign autographs. And I remember one night, Herbert Breslin, who was his manager, said to him, Luciano, it's time to go. And he looked at him and he said, I am not leaving here until the last person is done that I have to sign because that's who I am here for. And that's the type of person he was. It is a, a professional. Um, yep. Samuele, I could hold you here with many more stories. I just want to mention something, but we are kind of mm-hmm. closing that. Uh, okay. In 1983, your mom also launched uh, the EPCASO. There was the Ethiopian yes. Council for American Singers of Opera. Exactly. And I believe mm-hmm. this was something that uh, uh, Il Maestro Luciano was very adamant about that she Uh-oh, would yes, pursue. Yes, he was. Yes, he was on the board and and yeah, they were. They he came to many a times, and because the the school was in Oderzo, Italy, which is near Venice, and that's where they had the school. And he came there many a times. So, and you know, and and my parents last the last time they saw him was about three weeks before he passed. And uh, you know, they 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 just went to his house in Pesaro. He had a summer house there, and they you know he was in bed, not mm-hmm. feeling well, and my father. One day it was time to leave. He said, Ciao Luciano, ci vediamo. I mean, Ciao, see you Luciano, we'll see you soon. And, 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 and the master looked and looked at him and said, Eh, eh see, yes, for sure. I'm meeting, I don't think so. Yes, yes. Yeah, and that's the last time they saw him. It was about three weeks before he passed. He passed in September of 07. This was late August when they were there. Samuel, so, but. Our our time is is up, okay. and uh, so maybe in the future we'll bring you up again with some sure, additional. I'd love to come. <laughs> I have all kind of other things I can talk about. Uh, absolutely. So uh, okay. thank you very much. Buona serata. Salutami anche Buona Simone. Serata. Uh, we'll I will. see you soon. And <laughs> ciao ciao. ciao. So also for today, our time is, uh, is up. The Big Ben, il Big Ben ha detto stop and it's time for us to say arrivederci e alla prossima. We want to thank you for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, please contact us at the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. And next week, we will dedicate our episode in memoriam of anti-mafia judge Falcone, who was killed in a bombing on May 23rd in 1992 in Capaci, Sicily. Our guest will be the young president of the Sicilian Association called Addio Pizzo, Dario Riccobono, an Italian-American folk singer, Michela Mussolino, who has made of Sicilian folk music her passion and her life. Remember, if you or any of your family and friends have missed a prior episode or would like to listen to this episode again, please uh, visit us our website at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org and click on the Italian Radio Hour tab. Vorremmo ringraziare i nostri ospiti Russell Shorto e Samuele Bozzolla. Il nostro sponsor Istituto Mondo Italiano è alla Boara per la musica. Finally, before we leave, here is the language trivia for next week. What does conosco i miei polli mean? Again, what does conosco i miei polli mean? Send us your answer at the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. If you're not in the Pittsburgh area or might be traveling, remember you can also catch us streaming live at khbradio.com every Thursday at 5 o'clock. And be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at Italian Radio Hour. Until next time, alla prossima, ciao ciao!
The Italian Radio Hour has been sponsored by Istituto Mondo Italiano.